0.80 Kelvin. So I had it in my head that I wanted to create a pewter goblet, probably based on this goblet here that I designed when I was in seventh grade while on a field trip to an engineering firm. Somehow I had kept the printout of my work from way back in 1987, and I made this 3D printed version of it about three years ago. I'll leave a link in the description to a video with the full story. But, you know, as I thought about it, I decided I wanted something more practical, like a coffee mug or a beer stein. But with, you know, some of the same design elements of the goblet, namely, you know, like a, the faceted look, uh, maybe pinched in the center or hourglass shaped. To accomplish this, I fired up Fusion 360 and started to 3D doodle. My original idea was to make three octagons as references and then do a loft between them, but have the octagons twisted like a wood screw. After playing around with loft connections though, I changed my mind and settled on this design here. This was already 80% done, so all I really had to do was add the handle. I originally designed the handle as a separate piece to make the molding and casting easier, but as you'll see, this ended up as one single piece. After adding a few fillets to round the edges, I was ready to 3D print a prototype to see if I really liked it, and I did. This was printed with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, uh, which is twice the size of a normal nozzle so that I could speed up the printing process. Uh, the layer height was a standard 0.2 millimeter, so nothing fancy there. Uh, it actually came out really nice. And uh, if you're one of my supporters on Patreon, uh, I'll be posting an STL file uh, if you want to print this yourself. I will warn you, though, that um, it is said that 3D printed items are not food safe because uh, bacteria can collect between the layer lines. Um, I'll leave it up to you, though, to decide if that's true or not and if you really want to risk it. So now that I was happy with the design, it was time for the hard part, which was figuring out how the hell I was going to make the molds for this thing. I knew I was going to use Mold Max 60 for the molds, which is a high temperature and very smelly silicone rubber from a company called Smooth On. The problem was this comes as a two-part liquid, so now I had to make molds to make molds, and I wasn't even sure like what the silicone mold should look like to begin with. So after thinking about it for a week or so, I decided that what I needed was a solid mold to take up the space on the inside of the mug, and then a two-part mold um, for the outside of the mug. To facilitate, to facilitate this, I had to tweak the design to eliminate the hourglass shape on the inside of the mug. Otherwise, it would be terribly difficult to pull out the inner mold after casting. Um, I also thinned out the walls from six millimeters thick, like uh, that of a standard uh, coffee mug, ceramic coffee mug, to a more reasonable three millimeters, uh, since we don't need that extra thickness for something made out of metal. You can see that this resulted in a lot of excess material at the bottom of the mug, but what are we going to do? So with the new design made and sketchy plans in my head to continue, I created and printed the bucks that I'd use to make the silicone molds. Okay, so we had our original uh, prototype here and um, we were happy with this. So we designed our bucks um, from which we will make our molds, from which we will make our final product. So um, a buck is essentially a positive, you know, representation, a, a version of your 
um, final product that you are then make molds from to then make your final product. Um, sometimes it's an exact replica of your um, final product. Sometimes there's other features on it that will help you mold. Um, so for this, I actually have two different ones that I'm using to make my final mold system because this is not a solid shape. It has an inside cavity, you know, as well as the outside shape. So we actually have to make a mold in, we're going to make three parts to our mold. We're going to have an inside part to our mold, which this thing is going to make. So what I'm going to do is after smoothing this, um, I'm going to pour silicone rubber down inside of it. And you notice it's taller than the original because we're going to have extra silicone up top here, a solid piece. That's going to help us uh, later on when we're molding the real thing. Um, it'll give us something to grab onto to pull the, the silicone out of the, the cast metal. So this is for making that, that inside mold. <clears throat> now we need something that represents the outside of this mug, but we want it to be solid um, so that we can cast the outside. So as you saw when I designed it, I'm actually going to have a mold box around this, and this will be slightly raised, and we're going to fill it to the halfway point, let that cure, put mold release all over everything, pour the second half, and that'll give us a two-part mold that'll separate out like that. Um, I haven't printed the mold box yet, but that will be something I'll start today. Um, so that's the general idea. And once we have this mold and this half mold and this half mold, we can put them together. Notice this also goes higher than the original because we, we need to allow this space of this. Um, this will actually go down inside basically. So <clears throat> this um, extra bit represents the silicone that's going to be left over from this one. So if you imagine me pouring silicone into this, curing it, popping it out, right? Flipping that upside down and then casting these two halves putting them together upside down around this thing, we're going to have, we're going to end up with um, the mold we need, you know, uh, it's, you'll see as we go along, it's a little hard to visualize, but that's what we're working on now. But before I do that, um, these are fresh out of the printer and not sure how well you can see. Yeah, you can see here. So there's these little ridges that happen from the printing process um, because it's printed in layers, right? And not every layer is perfectly lined up with the one before it. Um, so we don't have a nice shiny, smooth surface. We have a rough, ridgy surface. And I want this to be as smooth as possible. We can always buff and sand, you know, afterwards, but that's... Um, I'd rather do most of the work up front. So what we're gonna do is do a process called vapor polishing. Um, I printed these out of ABS, which is a plastic I don't normally use um, because it is smelly and it likes to warp. Um, so what happens is it, um, when it's hot, it's a certain size and it, when it cools, it contracts quite a bit. So what happens is as you're printing layers on here, you have a layer that you print at a certain size, right? Um, and it cools and contracts a little bit. Then you print more layers on top of that. And each layer is sticking to the one before it and then cooling and contracting. So if you, you picture that like um, the layer on top of something sticking to it and contracting, it's going to make it kind of want to curl up like this. So you get the... You get warping that happens. 
Um, so to counteract that, that's why I use a, um, my printer has a heated bed, so it tries to keep the whole thing at an elevated temperature, and then when it's done printing, it'll turn off and everything will cool relatively at the same temperature and hopefully not warp unduly. So it works pretty good, although I am starting to get, let's see if I can find them. Uh, hang on one moment. Yeah, at the top here, you can see what happens. You see some of the layers are starting to separate a little bit. That's from the warping. There's, you know, there's stress fractures that happen. Um, hoping it'll be okay. They're not getting that far yet. Um, there's one, another one there. But we'll see. It should, they should smooth out still in the smoothing process. So going back to the smoothing process, um, I use ABS because we can vapor polish it with acetone because acetone is a solvent for ABS. It doesn't really work very well with my other normally normally used uh, printing plastics. So you print with this crappy stuff, ABS, and um, I'm going to show you the next process in a minute, but first I'm going to just clean these up a little bit. Um, I just want to sand or and or clean up uh, a lot of the gunk because you see like in here there's like fuzzies in that ridge and this is um this is going to be made for the outside so i need to kind of clean that up first uh, to give the smoothing process the best possible chance of working so i'll clean that up and then i'll show you what i would do for vapor polishing okay here we are with my vapor polishing setup it's very very high tech it is a paint can um, just an empty paint can I bought from the uh, hardware store. Um, got the lid that came with it. Take a piece of wax paper or parchment paper, cut it into a circle, place it on the inside of the lid. Take your object, place it inside on top of the lid. Inside the paint can, I have paper towels folded up and stuck to the walls and the bottom using magnets. Now I've used this a couple times so the paper towels look a little worn. You can use these over and over again. All I'm gonna do is take some acetone and I just splash it inside the paint can just enough to wet the paper towels just lightly. Um, you don't want it soaking. You don't want it so much where it's gonna drip. You just need a little bit of acetone. You know, less is more in this case. So what happens is it soaks into the paper towel and then we're gonna turn it upside down and stick it over our object, right? Encapsulate it. <clears throat> and the, um, the vapor, you know, this stuff, um, evaporates very easily, you know, in air. If I were to open a cap, it would just, over a few days, it would just be gone. So what happens is those vapors come around and swirl around our object and condense on the surface. And um, because it is a, because it is a solvent to our object, it will actually start to melt the surface of our object, okay? So it infuses it and starts to kind of melt it away. We let it sit for half an hour and let that acetone sit and start to melt our object. Then we pull off the paint can and we let it air out. And you'll notice when we first do this, it'll be um, a lot of times when you vapor polish, you know, people overdo it because what happens is you'll pull the paint can off and it'll look wet, but it'll still look ridgy. It won't look smooth yet. The smoothing actually happens during the aeration phase. So, you know, we're going to cover it for about a half an hour. We're going to pull it up and we're going to give it a good hour to, you know, for this to evaporate back off. And that's when, um, as it evaporates, that's when it'll actually start to smooth over and make this nice and shiny. So it looks dull now but you'll see how shiny it is when we're done. It'll be pretty cool. So with that said, I'm going to splash a little in my paint can and you'll see how much. Okay, I've splashed some in the paint can. You notice not even all of it is completely covered yet, but that's fine. It'll all, 
even out eventually. I think I may have put a little too much at the bottom, but hopefully that'll soak up onto the walls a little later. Okay, so now I'm going to put this over this and we'll just let it sit for half an hour. Okay, the pink hand's on top, so we're just going to let this sit for half an hour and um, come back to it. So, yes, very scientific here. Okay, it's been half an hour, and as you can see, it's wet looking, but it still, like, has all the layer lines, okay? So, a lot of people at this point would think, hey, this isn't done, and they'd keep going. But we're not most people. We're going to let this... Uh, dry out for about an hour. In the meantime, I'm going to push this back and I'm going to grab another lid and we're going to keep going with the other piece. Okay, so this one just got removed and as you can see, you know, the layer lines are still there but it's wet. This one has been drying for about a half that same half hour and there are layer lines, oops. There are layer lines still, but um, they're starting to be removed and smooth out. But we'll still give it some time to dry. If they don't remove and I don't like the look, then, you know, I'll just kick it up uh, another half an hour. That's, you know, but it's better to do a little at a time. But looking good so far. Okay, so I'm starting to print the mold box now. I've got a nice big fat nozzle on there so I can squeeze out the plastic pretty quickly. Um, also, our bucks have um, gone through the smoothing process and they look nice and shiny. You can see all the reflections and everything. There is a little bit of a, like a layered look to it. You can sort of still see streaky lines going in the horizontal. But I'm really not worried about that. At least we don't have the real hard, um, rough layer lines. It's nice and smooth to the touch now, which is perfect. Um, of course, we do have an imperfection because, you know, it's something that I made. So I'm going to take some UV curable resin and fill that in and hit it with some UV and uh, try to smooth it out a little bit, maybe with some, uh, I've got some really fine sandpaper. Um, but that's no good. We really don't want that. So I'm going to try to patch that up because I really don't want to reprint this whole damn thing only for probably the same thing to happen. Okay, here we are with our finished bucks. So this is for the inside of the mug and this one is for the outside. Um, there is no great meaning behind the dual colors here. I was just using up uh, leftover filament that I had. So, um, you know, I used up this ugly green and then um, I had a little bit of blue left on a spool, so I used that up. Nothing spectacular about that. Our outside of our mug is just jammed in there with pressure, but um, should be perfectly okay. Uh, let's see. As you can maybe see here, let's see if I can focus. Let's get some more light. As you can maybe see here with that white line, let's see. As you can maybe see here with this white line here, um, this is where we had the crack, and I filled it in with um, some 3D printer resin for my uh, my resin printer. It's UV curable resin, so I just took an X-Acto knife blade dipped it in the resin and kind of ran it along the crack, let it seep into it, used my UV cure light, cured it for, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and then just did that over and over again a couple of times until it was relatively um, smooth. So that's it, all patched. So it is still has sort of like a wavy pattern in here, but I'm okay with that. I think it will probably add you know, some character to the finished mug. I'm really not afraid of that at all. Um, but at least it's it's very smooth and uh, shiny and stuff like that. So it should make a good, for a good mold. So now the next thing we need to do is mix up my silicone and pour it in. So I'm going to do some math and figure out how much I need um, out of these. 
uh, roughly. I'm going to fill this one all the way up to the top. This one I'm only going to fill up halfway uh, because we want to do this as a two-part mold. Uh, shit. I'm also going to have to print out some little features I can float on the top of the first batch of silicone to make depressions that will later be, um, you know, I'll remove later and then fill up the second one that'll be index indexing marks um, just to help it align better when we uh, later put these two halves together. So I'm going to do that now. So now we have our silicone poured. We have the entire inside mold poured and we have the first half of the outside mold poured. We have our little alignment uh, markers, our little blue dots there floating on top of the silicone, which is going to We'll peel them off when once it's cured and before you know before we pour the second half and that's going to create little divots that's going to help us align the two halves of the mold later on um, don't worry about the excess silicone on top of the plastic there um, the drizzles i can peel that off once it's cured so no problem there so once this is done i'll spray the heck out of it with mold release and pour the second half into the mold box and let that sit overnight and we'll be done. So here's our finished molds and they turned out pretty good. I think they, uh, they turned out nice. I think there's one minor imperfection on one half, but it is what it is. So the only thing that we have to do now um, to get this ready, actually a couple things. We're going to ch chuck these in the oven for uh, a few hours at a certain temperature. Uh, according to the instructions, which basically helps do a post cure on this and it gets rid of all the excess um, moisture and chemicals that might be floating around in it. Uh, this will help us a lot because if we don't do this, they could um, kind of flash off and evaporate as we're you know, pouring the hot metal into the mold and that wouldn't be very nice. Um, also as an added uh, barrier against um, sticking and things like that. Uh, I've read that um, covering the mold with talc powder is, you know, required or suggested. So um, who am I going to argue with the internet? So that's what I did. So I coated, up, coated this up with some talcum powder and then put all the three pieces together. Now, if you're sitting there saying, you know what, dude, those rubber bands aren't going to hold. Yeah, I kind of knew it in the back of my head, and you're absolutely right, right. They did not mold, and most, you know, from the weight of the metal, everything leaked out the bottom. So that didn't work out. Um, I then got smart and stopped being lazy, cut out a couple of pieces of sheet metal, aluminum sheet metal, and uh, clamped them to the outside of the mold to hold everything together tight. As you can see, I used two hot pots because we had so much metal in this thing. I, I had to melt two uh, bars, I think they're two pound bars each, of uh, pewter. So the type of pewter I'm using is lead-free, of course, so I don't poison myself. Uh, specifically, it's the Britannia alloy which is made from 92% tin, 6% antimony, and 2% copper. Now I apologize that I did not record uh, myself pouring the metal, but this is the first time I ever did this and I just wanted to get it done and didn't feel like, you know, trying to deal with cameras and everything and having people virtually watch over my shoulder while I was trying to do something tedious for the first time. But it turned out okay. So as you see here, and um, you know, it seemed to pour fine. Uh, I did make one mistake. I probably should have the outside molds extend up um, higher above the, you know, what is going to be the, top, the bottom of the mug to allow me to pour more of the metal. So I had to over pour and kind of make it thick there. And, uh, you know, you can see it kind of ended up since all the junk and the gases and stuff float to the top. The bottom of the mug ended up being kind of rough. Of course, you know, we can always sand that afterwards. Um, but you see here, if we separate the, flip it over and separate the two halves of the mold, uh, it came out really nice. I think it looked looks pretty good. 
and um, you know the inside popped out quite easily so that pulled out no real problems so the only this you know I was super happy with this and I think for a first attempt it was nearly perfect unfortunately because it is one of my projects there was one minor screw up which pretty much ruined everything and that was again because of the um, all the gases and dross and everything floating to the top of the pour which is the bottom of the mug uh, the bottom of the mug was kind of lumpy and uh, in one part it was really 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 thin so much so that it was actually leaking like quite a bit so that is not good and uh, the easiest way I can think to fix it was I just chopped off the bottom with a hacksaw well actually I had a powered bandsaw so I wasn't doing it by hand and then um, just put it back in the mold and re-poured it and as you can see it came out pretty good. I mean, it has some imperfections, you know, it's, I could spend some time with uh, files and sandpapers and stuff and polishing and get this thing perfect, but um, I don't know that I'm going to bother because I kind of like it a little crude and I'm also quite lazy. But this thing is insane. It's three and a half pounds. <laughs> Three and a half pounds of muggage <laughs> is really hysterically heavy, um, even not filled. But it does work. I mean, it holds holds water, and uh, it looks pretty cool. So I'm overall very, very happy with this. And uh, especially for a first attempt, I think it was a, a cool project to, as a proof of concept that I could you know, make my own metal objects at home basically right it's pretty cool so with that everybody um thanks a lot for looking over my shoulder on this project and hopefully you learned some things uh, mostly from my mistakes and i'll see you again in the next video cheers this video brought to you by briankramerbooks.com BrianKramerBooks.com for all your humorous science fiction needs.